Now I'd like to start the lecture. Hello, everyone. My name is Keita Takayama, and I'm the head of the Global Education Office at the Graduate School of Education, Kyoto University. Today, I'm going to take the role of moderator. Once again, thank you for joining us for the lecture series we are hosting toward critical, historical, and transnational dialogue on Japanese model of education. I'd like to begin by giving a brief introduction to our lecture series before introducing today's speaker, Dr. Mila Shimabukuro. Starting with today's lecture, we'll be holding lectures at the end of every month using Zoom until March of next year. For example, we are going to look at、uh, the Japanese Americans who are Who went to、uh, Canada or also to the US? And also, we are going to look at the education system in Taiwan. And we are going to look at all the things in other countries. And recently, Education Ministry has been introducing Educot Nippon. In various b a c k g r o u n d some Japanese education has w e n t into the、uh, overseas and other countries. And through that process, we would like to look at the history and the approach of Japanese education. And that way, we would like to、uh, position the Japanese education in the context of、uh, the history. And that's why we came up with this lecture series. About the annual schedule of this lecture, we would like to share with you the schedule with you. Just briefly, this is the schedule. We are going to have、uh, lectures throughout the year. We are going to have a total of nine lectures using Zoom. I'd like to have all of you. And if you miss、uh, those lectures, these lectures will be available on our website. All lectures will be given in English and Japanese with simultaneous interpretation. Now I'd like to turn to today's speaker, Dr. Mila Shimabukuro. She received a doctor's degree in composition and rhetoric from the University of Wisconsin Medicine in 2009 and is currently teaching at the University of Washington. Her research takes an interdisciplinary approach to the experiences of American minorities, including those of Japanese descent, in confronting and resisting racism through the act of writing. And in 2015, she published a book based on her doctoral thesis, Relocating Authority Japanese Americans Writing to Redress Mass Incarceration, and was published by the University of Colorado Press. The book Delves into the concept of gaman as a symbol of hidden resistance through a reading of Japanese immigrants' experiences in the camps and their diaries and other documents. The book has received very high praise in composition and rhetoric studies and in American immigration and minority studies. If you think about it for a moment, gaman is a word that is used a lot in the daily lives of Japanese people. When I think of gaman, the first thing that comes to mind is gaman in wartime Japan. And many children have to listen to teachers' long talks. Or gaman in summer camps for studying for exams and club activities. So, those are the、uh, situations where we use gaman. Also, we have a lot of natural disasters and people of the victim,、uh, the gaman of the victim of those disasters are well known. And we also have to endure、uh, the hot weather in Kyoto. And we are also now experiencing gaman because of coronavirus. But we also have hope. When we do gaman, because long talk of teachers eventually come to an end, and also study hard work for the entrance exam of universities eventually come to an end. 
Also, the perseverance and endurance caused by natural disasters also eventually come to an end. Although it's very hot now in Kyoto, we will eventually have the beautiful autumn, and coronavirus will eventually end as well. So we all share the concept of gaman, and gaman today. Will bring about hope for the future, and many people accept gaban as a virtue. However, in this lecture, we are going to talk about gaman in a camp. Those Japanese American people who are incarcerated in the camp. So there is a very special meaning to gaman in this context. In the context of anti-racial、uh, movement in the U.S., when gaman is discussed in that context, we may be able to see more concentrated version of, or the condensed concept of gaman. It was this expectation in mind that I approached Mirasan to give a lecture. Actually, Mira and I are old friends. Her husband, Wayne Ayu, was studying for a doctorate in education at the University of Wisconsin Medicine, like me. We became very close, and I still remember those days as good memory. My daughter, who was one year old at the time, was in their arms a lot, but she is already a freshman in high school. I left the U.S. in 2006, and it's a great pleasure to see Mira again in this lecture. Now, Mira, me inwardly before I did private writing the legacy of Japanese American internment and the rhetorics of Gaman. Thank you very much to Dr. Takayama for the invitation to speak. I'm delighted to be presenting today, since I have yet to address a Japanese audience. So today I am going to talk about how the Japanese ethos of gaman influenced the use of a resistant private writing practice among Japanese Americans during their mass incarceration, also known as internment, by the U.S. government during World War II. In doing so, I mean to address the use of gaman specifically among Japanese Americans. In relation to their World War II incarceration, I make no presumptions about the use of the term in contemporary Japan. Let me begin with two poems written during the incarceration period. The first was written by an Ise writer, Sanada Hikyo, while detained in one of the incarceration camps. Published and translated into English in 1976 in what was then an emerging Asian American studies journal called Amerasia. I'll read how it was translated, but let the interpreters read out loud in Japanese because my pronunciation is somewhat embarrassing. Endure, we are enduring by the color of our skin. 我慢して我慢している皮膚の色。The second is by a Nisei writer, Toyo Suyamoto. Gain was written and published in Trek, a literary magazine written, edited, and published by incarcerees in Topaz, the camp located in the state of Utah, where the U.S. government sent most of the Nikkei folks who lived in the greater San Francisco area of Northern California. Gain. I sought to see the barren earth and make wild beauty take firm root, but how could I have known the waiting long would shake me inwardly before I dared not say what would be gain from such untimely planting or what flower worth the pain? I'd like to consider sentiments from both of these poems 
as introductions to the rhetorics of gaman among Japanese Americans imprisoned by their own government during World War II. The notion that the experience of mass incarceration called forth endurance based on race or by the color of one's skin, or that the experience also brought forth at times a turn inward before speaking or acting boldly in public, me inwardly before I dared. But before I discuss these ideas and how they intersect with Japanese American rhetorics of gaman, let me give you a little background on myself and a brief overview of the so-called internment. By training, I'm a scholar and teacher of writing, composition, literacy, and rhetoric studies. But as a kid, I grew up in the Japanese American redress movement. This movement sought redress and reparations during the 1970s and 1980s for the US incarceration of Nikkei people during World War II. So even though my own family had been based in Hawaii, where Japanese and Okinawan Americans were not imprisoned in mass, stories and memories about the World War II experience for Japanese Americans swirled around me when I was a kid. Combining this personal experience with my scholarly interests in writing, rhetoric, and minoritized in minoritized communities in the United States, I ended up focusing on writing as a form of redress during incarceration and published this book in 2015. But to understand how writing served as a form of redress during incarceration, it's important to know a little about the circumstances and conditions of incarceration itself. The first thing to know is that the terms used for incarceration are contested. During World War II, the US media, the camps were typically referred to relocation camps, a euphemism. Today, they are still popularly known as internment camps. But since this is a legal term referring to the imprisonment of foreign nationals, and at least two thirds of all imprisoned people were US citizens, this term is misleading. Redress activists of the 1970s and the 1980s tended to call the camps concentration camps. But following the trend of many scholars and community historians today, I use the term incarceration camps. I will also use the word camp since it is used as shorthand within and among many Japanese American survivors and descendants today. If people are interested in uh, more about the politics of terminology, you can go to densho.org and see the article, Do Words Matter? Now for some overview. In spring 1942, a few months after the United States officially entered World War II, the American government imprisoned 120,000 of its residents of Japanese ancestry in camps operated by the War Relocation Authority from roughly 1942 to 1945. Nikkei residents were first placed in what were euphemistically called assembly centers, constructed on racetracks, fairgrounds, and livestock pavilions located on the outskirts of major West Coast cities. There, the majority of incarcerees were forced to live in horse stalls and stadiums in makeshift rooms divided by thin half wall partitions. When incarcerees were moved to more permanent camps operated by the War Relocation Authority, the quarters were cramped and flimsy constructed. Made primarily out of two by fours and tar paper, the structures barely withstood the harsh summer or the winter weather of the mostly desert camps. 
In most cases, families of five to eight members were assigned bare rooms without inside walls or ceilings, measuring 20 by 24 feet, while smaller families shared rooms of 16 by 20 feet. Each barrack held four to six family rooms while 12, while 12 to 14 barracks composed a block of 250 to 300 incarcerees, all of whom shared a mess hall, laundry room, latrine, and recreation hall. Incarcerees did most things communally, including eating meals, showering, and using toilets, where dividers did not exist and hot water was inconsistently available. Medical facilities were inadequate and culturally relevant or even nutrient-filled food was hard to come by. In other words, subpar living conditions were rampant. And relevant to today's discussion, incarcerees used, often used private forms of writing to vent about these conditions or work through inner debates over the value of Nikkei public protest in camp which took place often throughout the camp years. Despite what we know about Japanese American protest during incarceration, Japanese Americans have often been imagined as the quiet Americans. In the US mind, this idea implicitly suggested that Nikkei people both passively consented to the mass incarceration and fully succumbed to the cultural oppression brought about by the war's racist hysteria. Having experienced this racialized stereotype myself and knowing some of the details and history that I outlined earlier, I became interested in the rhetorics of Gaman, which seemed to me a call for a kind of quiet behavior and the potential relationship to writing. As fiction writer Hasai Yamamoto, herself a formerly incarcerated Nisei, told literary critic King Kok Chung, most Nisei were brought up with Japanese ideas like gaman. I imagine my writing has been influenced by such behavior patterns. It would be strange if it wasn't. While this quote was used to suggest gaman impacted the content of Yamato's writing, as a scholar grounded in sociocultural theories of literacy, I wanted to explore how Gaman may have influenced the activities and practices of writing by many incarcerated Nikkei. And it's this exploration that led me here. Before I discuss the ways I think Gaman could have played a role in the writing practices of incarcerated Nikkei, I need to address the word as it operates and has operated in Japanese America. So let me turn to the struggles over interpretation that have often surrounded gaman in English speaking Nikkei communities with what I consider the contested rhetorics of gaman in Japanese America. The word gaman first entered my vocabulary via Nobuko Miyamoto, longtime singer, dancer, and actor well known among the first generation of Pan-Asian American activists for the politically inspired, race conscious, and consciousness raising music she co-wrote for the first Asian American movement album, A Grain of Sand, in 1973. But during the height of the redress movement in the 1980s, Miyamoto released The Best of Both Worlds, featuring the song Gaman. Having met Nobuko once, I played her album so much as a teenager that I can still chant the song today. Walking to Mess Hall, I hold Obachan's hand. Passing rows of barracks, we fight the wind and sand. Why do they hate us so? Will we be here all our lives? For the chorus, Nobuko's voice seems to offer a shield as she chants a strong, melodic, back-of-the-throat whisper to surround the listener. 
Gaman, be strong. Moto Gaman Shiten Ikone. While I don't know the literal meaning of each and every word at the time, Nobuko made it possible for English speaking listeners like me to understand what they all meant together. As such, my first association with Gaman was a race conscious and consciousness raising voice, encouraging me to keep going and be strong. But Nobuko's song is only one of many English dominant Nikkei interpretations of Gaman. Noted again and again by Nisei, former incarcerees as being one model of ideal behavior put forth by either their Issei parents or their teachers in Japanese school. Gaman is most often translated within US-based communities today as either endure and or persevere. It has also been defined by Japanese Americans in a number of ways, including stick things out at all costs, bear up, develop self-discipline, and control over one's emotions. Amidst and across these definitions, though, Gaman has often been interpreted by both Nikkei and non-Nikkei alike as a call to quietly accept oppression, especially in relation to camp. And this interpretation is not without warrant. As early as 1942, right after the US government forced the Nikkei community out of their homes, incarcerees were publicly writing about the term as one that circled around them. In Concentration Camp US Style, an article published in the New Republic, Nisei Ted Nakashima wrote from the Puyallup Assembly Center reporting a strikingly candid description of conditions. Detailing camp conditions, Nakashima notes that mealtime queues extend for blocks and the ways they are surrounded by wet mud that stinks when it dries. And then drawing a distinction between himself and others who might be uttering words of advice, Nakashima asserts, I don't have enough of that Japanese heritage, gaman, a code of silent suffering and ability to stand pain. Twenty-seven years later, sociologist Harry Kitano would encode his translation of the term during a year of popular uprising around the world. First published in 1969, Kitano's text, Japanese Americans, the Evolution of a Subculture, became for many years one of the most cited works on Japanese American experience. In the midst of a chapter prescriptively labeled the culture, Kitano defines the man as one value among others that quote, explains why the quote, Japanese have a quote, low degree of acting out, overt rebellion and independence, translating the term as internalization and suppression of anger and emotion. Further describing and delimiting the function of this ethos, Kitano offers a family anecdote about his father's, quote, early episodes of discrimination and mistreatment to which he was subjected. A simple walk down the street in 1919 in San Francisco often resulted in being shoved into the gutter and called a damn Jap. But father would gum on, that is take no retaliatory action and the incidents never escalated into serious conflict. Given discussions like these, it is no wonder that Gaman has been interpreted as a call to internalize or accept oppression without complaint, especially given the rise of this ethos during the Meiji era in Japan, the period in which most Issei who were incarcerated first immigrated. As Takashi Fujitani argues, Values like Gaman were promoted in Meiji Japan because they were seen as, quote, the most conducive to development as a nation and control over people. 
Fujitani illustrates by discussing the ways Ninomiya Sontoku was promoted during the Meiji era as a national icon by erecting statues of him carrying a load of firewood on his back. A similar statue, which is dedicated to Issei pioneers, can be found in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles, pictured here. According to Fujitani, the Me Meiji government mythologized Sontoku to help persuade common people to work hard and practice frugality. Such virtues are aligned in the U.S. mind as intrinsically Japanese or Asian, just like passive or subservient interpretations of Gaman. Presumed cultural values then can easily become fixed or essentialist qualities when they are attached to racialized others. But as Fujitani argues, values like gaman are ones that quote, existed among some people in some places in Japan prior to the Meiji era that were taken up and fostered by the Meiji government because they appeared congenial to creating a modern and powerful nation. What's important to remember though, is while Fujitani argued that most cultural traditions were invented for particular purposes, so are they still being invented, still being shaped by the contemporary rhetorics of transnational Nikkei communities. Take for instance, the Japanese American National Museum's Encyclopedia of Japanese American History. Under the entry of Gaman, the encyclopedia begins with the usual definitions of endure, persist, and persevere, but then immediately follows with, or do one's best in times of frustration and adversity. This one line summary is followed by a short paragraph, first citing, then complicating Kitano's definition. Quote, Kitano maintains that to gaman is to take no aggressive retaliatory action against one's misfortune. Betty Furuta asserts that the employment of gaman by the Issei during World War II in order to endure the humiliation and hardship of incarceration is mistaken by many non-Japanese to indicate a lack of assertiveness or initiative rather than strength in the face of difficulty and suffering. In this way, the authors of the encyclopedia revise gaman's connotation from passivity to strength. More recently, Gaman played a prominent role in the Broadway musical Allegiance, inspired by veteran Japanese American actor George Takei, who was incarcerated in the camps with his family when he was four. Gaman was one of the central songs in the musical, sung primarily by Leah Salonga, with lyrics and music by Jay Kuo. Here's an excerpt of the lyrics It will all be all right. There's a way through this night. Stay strong on this long road. We bury our pain. There's a word we will say to help get through each day. We will bear any nightmare with a simple refrain. Come on, come on. Steady and sure, keep faith and endure. Come on, come on. Hold your head high and carry on. Gaman. Based on my readings across texts, so oh, pardon me, the use of the first person plural in these lyrics brings me to one additional aspect of Japanese American rhetorics of Gaman. Based on my readings across texts, while Japanese American Gaman is often discussed in terms of individual psyches, it has as at its base an ethical commitment to a collective good. For an example, uh, Ken Matsudaira, a rare bilingual sansei whose parents were both incarcerated during the war, says he thought of Gaman as a call for self-dialogue, especially in the midst of others experiencing a similar hardship. That is, people should Gaman in order to avoid inflicting additional psychological or emotional strain on others by endlessly and thus selfishly 
complaining about something everyone is experiencing. Indeed, Japanese American Women Studies scholar Mei Nakano seems to agree as she claims that the ethos of Gaman is intricately tied to the belief that one should develop an acute consciousness of oneself as a social being, as someone whose actions affect other people, in that it often requires superseding one's private needs for the good of the larger group. Of course, this understanding of Gaman can bring us back to perhaps a more subservient understanding. And in fact, in the US, where rugged individualism is promoted to our detriment, the notion that one would put their private needs aside for the good of the group can seem particularly abhorrent. And right now, we are seeing this with just the simple mandate that people should wear masks in public to help curb the spread of COVID-19. But it doesn't have to be seen this way. And the argument over this interpretation is exactly why I argue that the rhetorics of Gaman in Japanese American communities are contested. Indeed, for many incarcerees and their descendants, the ethos of Gaman merely exasperated subservient behavior, along with any and all forms of internalized shame and anger over camp. It's for this reason that you could hear the call during the redress movement that sought a government apology and reparations for the World War II incarceration. We will not Gaman any longer. In other words, we will not silently endure what camp did to us anymore. And this is an activist sentiment that I personally would fully support. It is only recently in the so-called post-redress era that I think it is worth revisiting the rhetorics behind Gaman. To do so earlier could be used as justification to shut people up, to not speak truth to power and publicly redress the period of mass incarceration. Which is why in my attempts to attend to this ethos and all its competing definitions and implicit rhetorics, I have tried to find a common denominator across all meanings. Given the strength, silence, internalization, forbearance, self-discipline, suppression, and emotional control, it seems that no matter whether one is simply accepting of or persevering through adversity, in order to gaman, one must strive to focus inwardly while maintaining an outward silence, all to endure hardship so as not to inflict further emotional strain on others. That is, to gaman, one must simultaneously develop an interpersonal awareness of self and cultivate the self-discipline necessary to exert control over one's emotion thoughts all in order to attend to the larger community's well-being. These are the working definitions I use in my book. With this more complex understanding of the rhetorics of Gaman, let me turn to a discussion of the relationship between this ethos and private writing performed during camp. Just as Gaman relies on an active and dynamic conception of an inner self, that is capable of developing self-control or order. Proponents of self-writing imagine the activity of composing as a process that retains the potential for helping one bring order and composure to our inner selves. Particularly true in times of imprisonment, Lynn Bloom notes, for example, that such periods sometimes provide unusual time for reflection, such that personal writing can become a means of gaining perspective on a cramped existence and of coping through verbal escape. That is, writing can, as Ralph Cintron put it, offer us a delusion of control through an opportunity of reducing language and experience to something manageable. In this way, several scholars have noted the way self-writing can serve as a powerful act of survival helping to collect or recuperate a self or social identity that processes of oppression have fractured, alienated, or denied.
While Gaman shares with personal writing this kind of opportunity to compose oneself, Gaman also relies on a socially conscious use of inward focus and outward silence or lack of public utterance. In this way, the contested rhetorics of Gaman allude to work on the rhetorics of silence, especially work that calls attention to power differences. Calling upon the relationship between silent meditation and private forms of literacy, Pat Belenoff argues for the rhetorical efficacy of attending inward, pointing to how historically those who have been robbed of the right to speak have found silent reflection or meditation to be an, an empowering doorway out of the constraints set up against their voices. In addition, both Anne Ruggles Gear and Cheryl Glenn have noted how some public silences are inherently ethical or political in that a refusal to disclose the details of hardship may simply be a refusal to participate in the pain or exploitation of others or a way to take social responsibility all the while refusing to be compliant. However, <clears throat> While the rhetorics of silence help complicate meanings behind such outward public silence, such discussions can easily conflate two modes of verbalization, speech and writing. For many folks in my field, silence serves as the converse of speech, suggesting that silence is without words or verbal activity. But Asian American Studies scholar King Kong Chung has discussed the ways Asian American writers both exploit and comment on silence's articulate possibilities. With her discussion, Chung notes that the character for silence in Chinese and Japanese is not so much the opposite of speech than it is the opposite of noise, motion, and commotion. That is, we are reminded via Chung that silence is not simply the absence of verbal action, but the absence of noise or outward commotion. This distinction is important as we consider not just the ethos of Gaman, but also how that ethos might be served by writing, a means of expression and communication that is different from, but not opposite to, speech. Chung points to this difference at the end of her introduction to the work of three Asian American women writers, two of whom confront the legacy of incarceration in their post-war written work. Quote, of particular note in these works is the inverse relation between spoken and written expression. Many of their characters distill onto the page what they cannot say out loud. While many characters have trouble speaking or telling their life stories, they all excel on paper. Their unspoken emotions break into print. It is this breaking into print whenever one is unable to speak that allows one to simultaneously remain quiet and be active at the exact same time, allowing writers to both verbalize feelings and thought all the while never making a sound. In other words, the silent speech of private writing not only allows for an active exploration of emotion thoughts, but also provides safe passage for this inward activity to take place amidst one's ethical commitments to remain outwardly silent in public. In this way, private writing provides a technology for Gaman to be put into rhetorical action. It's for all these reasons that I have come to see Gaman as one of the ethoi guiding private Nikkei literacies in action under mass incarceration. As I have come to call the activities and texts of this private form of re redress rhetoric, writing to Gaman speaks to the use of this quiet technology to privately organize one's emotion thoughts and or verbalize dissent while sharpening an awareness of oneself as connected to others enduring hardship. Here I am attempting to complicate a discourse of passivity and acceptance in the face of oppression that has already surrounded Gaman, particularly during incarceration and later the redress movement years. 
which is not to deny that Gaman continues to retain the potential to stifle verbal activity, as can be seen across the term's history. But this ethos of presumed passivity also has the potential to cultivate such activity, as we will soon see. Again and again, incarcerees individually broke into print to collectively survive and resist the psychological hardships and humiliations induced by their own government. This analysis is simply one part of recognizing that reality. So examples of this soundless verbal activity are available in memoirs, oral histories, and the primary texts themselves, including English, English language diaries, private letters, and unpublished poems donated by the authors or the author's family to the public archives of the Japanese American National Museum or the online Bensho project or miscellaneous university sponsored archives in California, both physical and virtual. In other words, while this writing was at one time written and kept among the private papers of the incarcerated writers, it has since been made public by the writer or their descendants. Aside from my reliance on work discussed in or donated to these archives, let me stress that the writings I discuss here were all composed in English. Obviously, a fuller perspective of writing to Gaman would need to include writings in Japanese. But given my own lack of Japanese language literacy, I do not make arguments regarding texts and activities beyond the ones that I studied. I also want to be clear that writing to Gaman as a concept does not exhaust the range of what it meant to write in private under mass incarceration. Writing to Gaman merely serves as one heuristic with which we might better understand a literacy practice that grows out of a specific historical moment, still mistakenly referred to as an internment. For now, let's look at some examples of writing to Gaman. Here's Yoshiko Uchida, an award-winning young adult and children books, uh, children's book writer, writing in 1982 in her memoir uh, of camp. Here we can see the Gaman-like qualities she describes and upholds as having helped her and her parents survive camp, who she writes, taught her to endure as they did with dignity, stoic composure, disciplined patience, and an amazing resiliency of spirit. But if you look at Uchida's inwardly written diaries, we see some contrast to these Gaman-like qualities. As she employs a number of repeated textual strategies to verbalize her dissent. In these exact entries, for example, Uchida complains about pending policies swearing at U.S. Attorney General Earl Warren, but rhetorically bleeping herself out on the page and using capital letters and underlined texts, sometimes double and triple underlines and repeated exclamation points. Heard that California is going to demand that citizenship rights of Japanese be revoked. How disgusting. Also, exclusion of Japanese from California and repatriation for all at the end of the war. If that doesn't sound undemocratic, I don't know what does. To hell with Warren. Gosh, this new business of drafting Niseis for a Nisei combat unit for overseas action makes me so sick. Gosh, the poor fellows being tossed here and there and talk about discrimination. This whole war is so damn futile. These are all handwritten strategies we do not typically associate with stoic composure or disciplined patience. In another diary, an anonymous woman writes of her anxious desire to ease people's lives in camp all the while legitimizing the community's Gaman-like ideals. 
I feel so much I want to contribute. My mind runs around at a crazy speed, can hardly control it. I wish I could be more calm. I must cultivate it. I must. Otherwise, people will not respect me because I am such a rattle brain. I must endeavor to correct it. Me, no good. But then I feel the fight within me. For Mary Nakahara, writing to Gaman not only enabled her to verbalize dissent and organize her emotion thoughts, but also sharpen her awareness of others enduring hardship, the social component of Gaman. Here, on the cover of her diary, <clears throat> She writes of her explicit desire to avoid writing anything that would hurt, humiliate, look down, blame, or show dislike for any person, nation, race, religion, or station in life. But in camp, the first time Nakahara lives solely among other Nikkei, she learns endless stories of anti-Japanese discrimination from older co-workers. For example, in an entry dated September 9th, 1943, she writes that she has just learned about a prospective nursing student, a young Nikkei woman she never met, from one of her co-workers. Nakahara proceeds by writing about this young woman and the hospital she wrote to, asking for admittance to their nursing program. After stating bluntly that not one would accept her, Nakahara struggles with her own reaction and copies 14 different rejection letters into her journal, almost as if she has to internalize the evidence herself. As a young female office worker herself, Nakahara seems to identify with the young woman, but also sees the adverse experience as beyond herself as she writes that she will not quote, really be able to understand the problems of the Nisei until she comes up against prejudice and discrimination. This is, of course, an ironic statement since she was writing from an incarceration camp. But as a whole, this entry with its 14 copied letters like the one and a half you see on this page suggests a need to witness hardship, even if only for oneself. This literacy event then becomes one of convincing the self that one is living among others that are truly being impacted by negative forces, even if that self is not. So for those Japanese Americans who believe that their lives would be better off if they could just persevere through the duration of camp, the activity of writing to Gaman helped incarcerees both physically survive and psychologically resist mass incarceration. And this meant many could participate in the public redress movement of the 1970s as cultural workers and political activists. In this way, I see writing to Gaman as one part of writing to redress or the use of writing to set right what was wrong about and relieve the suffering caused by mass incarceration. Here, I want to call attention to the double meaning of the word to in English as a signifier of both in order to and towards. I have come to view this private activity both as one performed in order to redress the circumstances of mass incarceration and as one that enabled the community as a whole to move toward a collective redress movement a movement made possible in part by the community's explicit values of perseverance, strength, and attention to self, to a self amidst others. In this way, we might think of writing to Gaman as not only a private writing activity performed in order to redress one's adverse circumstances, but also to precondition oneself amongst others for subsequent public acts. In this way, writing to Gaman becomes akin to what Kimberly Harrison calls rhetorical rehearsals. As Harrison makes clear, private writing can serve as a clandestine activity of ideological preparation and practical training necessary for public acts. 
Where writing to Gaman differs, though, is that the activity rests on a pre-existing ethos that sees the individual as interdependently connected to other people. That is, one may individually be writing to Gaman, but only because they live among a collective group of people who are all enduring hardship together. In addition, writing to Gaman does not simply hold the potential to result in a public presentation of the self, but instead holds the potential to help one take part in a public presentation of the collective hardship. That is, writing to Gaman should not be seen as a soloist rehearsal, but as an act of individual preconditioning for an ensemble performance in this case, individually writing toward collective movement. And this is why separating the private activities of writing to Gaman from public acts can be a bit misleading. For example, former writer and carcery Mitsuye Yamada has spoken of the ways her poems silently tucked away in a shoebox after she wrote them during her night job at the camp clinic were, in her words, coaxed out of the mothballs by the editors at a feminist press in the mid-1970s, who then published them in a book that influenced a number of Asian American women writers, including myself. For Mary Nakahara, the private use of her journal to organize her emotion thoughts not only allowed for the development of an early commitment to social justice, but also served as a political training ground for the work she would come to be known for after she got married, claimed her Japanese name, and became the organizer, Yuri Kochiyama, whom many activists across the United States have come to know as the heartbeat of many public struggles for justice and who actively called upon we Japanese in America to quote, speak up now during the redress movement. And Toyo Suyamoto, who wrote that poetry was her only outlet when she could not speak, has since been hailed as the Nikkei Poet Laureate as she continued to author both private and public poems throughout the camp years publishing in both camp newspapers and in prominent literary magazines where, while she was still incarcerated. And who can say how Yoshiko Uchida's silent swearings in her diary might have enabled her to distill her writing into award-winning prose for both children and young adults alike. While I'm not in a position to argue that these incarcerees consciously wrote towards a collective movement as they wrote to Gaman, let me point to one more theme implicit in the rhetorics of Gaman, that of waiting for a different future. This theme can be noted in several locations. As May Nakano wrote, indeed, a mood of no matter what underscored the immigrants' outlook, they would Gaman be patient, persevere, no matter what, to survive. Similarly, Ken Matsudaira added to his description of self-dialogue that the closest analogy he could make was, this too will pass. And, psycholo and psychologist Donna Nagata noted that Gaman was one value that helped Nikkei families rebuild after incarceration since it, quote, led many Nisei to avoid dwelling on the past. And we can find parallels today. As people across the world are called on to shelter in place during the pandemic, these parallels have not been lost on Japanese Americans concerned with the legacy of incarceration. For example, the Japanese American National Museum has begun selling gaman masks, the ones in black, as has the Etsy site for the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages, which are in red. As the description on the museum site says, here's a mask that reminds us of the spirit in which we face adversity, gaman. Gaman means to persevere and endure adversity with inner strength, 
It is an expression of a concept that is synonymous with the Japanese American spirit during a time of extraordinary upheaval and uncertainty, the forced incarceration of 120,000 Japanese American in concentration camps during World War II. And Naomi Hirahara, who is a renowned sansei mystery writer and chronicler of Japanese American life, recently posted on Facebook in April after many of us had been in lockdown quarantine for about a month. She and the commentators on her thread, including myself, mused about the significance and differences between calling upon gaman and shikataganai as mantras for getting through the pandemic. So whether or not one thinks controlling one's outward expression of emotions in the midst of hardship while they look to the future is politically wise or psychologically healthy, we should be clear that gaman is not simply an ethos of passivity. It has been and can be a conscious activity. For Japanese Americans who are often stereotyped in the United States as quiet, submissive model minorities, understanding this is key. Despite its historical ascendance as a presumably distinct and static Nikkei concept, Gaman is so much more than the passive code of silent suffering Ted Nakashima described. It is strength, endurance, self-discipline, and awareness of others and the ability to keep the future in sight. That is, for many incarcerated Japanese Americans and their descendants today, Gaman is a rhetoric of survival plus resistance against the onslaught of racism. And in the context of camp, the mass incarceration of Nikkei bodies, private writing provided a technology for Gaman to be put into rhetorical action. Using private writing, Japanese Americans attended to themselves by the color of their skin, venting anger and sadness, organizing thought and emotions, and sharpening their awareness of others inwardly before they dared. Outwardly unspoken, inwardly expressed, Gaman preconditioned them and us for public acts to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>